Let's, let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer before we uh, jump into our message for today. Bow your heads. Dear loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. We thank you for everything uh, that you have blessed us with. We thank you so much for this Sabbath day that we can rest, that even bees and beavers will, will rest on your Sabbath day. And so we thank you for this rest that is greatly needed for all of us. We ask that you please uh, be with us during this time. Help us learn something new about your word and help us get a blessing from it. All this we ask in your name. Amen. God is faithful. It's an attribute of God that so many people today are so skeptical about. In our, lo- in our world, we see promises being made all the time. Till death do us part, if I get elected, you'll get a 15% raise after two years. There's so many promises, and promises are a wonderful thing. They give us hope for today and confidence for tomorrow. What parent hasn't cheered up their child's glum face with a promise of ice cream? Or a quarter to put in the candy machine to get some candy. And yes, some people make promises that they intend not to keep from the very beginning. But most of the time, when someone makes a promise, generally they intend on keeping it. But it doesn't always happen that way. We see broken promises all around us. Adultery, divorce, corruption, layoffs, promises, they don't, they don't always guarantee that something will or will not happen in your life. And the thing is, life might be easier if we didn't make promises, right? If we didn't expect others to keep their promises, life might be easier, but then life would be lacking hope. There would be less hope in our lives. And God makes promises. He made his first promise to Adam and Eve. Uh, We have it on the screen here. Genesis 2, 17. Therefore, uh, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And what happened when they ate it? They didn't die right away. It seemed that God did not keep his promise. But something else happened that day. It was a spiritual death that had occurred. They became separated from God. And they were without hope. And so to fix it, God made another promise. God made a promise that Eve would have a descendant who would come to destroy sin, get rid of sin, and give salvation to all of humankind. A Savior was going to come. The devil was going to hurt this Savior. But he would overcome this hurt, and he would rise from the dead. Let's jump straight into our text for today. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. And let's read verses 22 through 24. And we're going to mainly stick in this verse today. Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 24. And I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. Give me a good hearty amen when you get there. Acts 2, 22 through 24. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, has crucified and put to death. 
whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Several millennia after God made that first and second promise to Eve, Peter stood on the temple steps preaching to a group of people. He was proclaiming the gospel message that God had come to earth to dwell with sinful human beings so that we may have life. Even the circumstances of Jesus' birth were miraculous. Next verse. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And while here Jesus performed so many signs and so many miracles, which pointed to who he was claiming to be. He was claiming to be the Son of God, and he was. And his own people, the people that Peter was speaking to that day in the temple, they had rejected him and given him up to be crucified. However, this too was a fulfillment of God's law. Next, next verse. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. And that's in Isaiah, which was written a long time before Jesus lived. God knew exactly what was going to happen. And he had planned for it to happen. But the people listening to Peter on that day, they were still guilty. But luckily for them, Jesus rose from the dead. God God made impossible promises, impossible for us to do. Promises that would cost him so much. Promises that would cost him the life of his Son, his only son. But for God, nothing is too much. Everything else is is cheap compared to that sacrifice. So God kept his promise to Eve because God is faithful. When I say God is, I want you to say faithful. God is faithful. There we go. Let's continue reading our text. Let's go back to Acts chapter 2. And let's read verses 25 to 32. 25 to 32. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, or the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, or the grave, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus gave, God gave, has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. So in Peter's explanation to this crowd, he refers to a promise God made to David, which was Jesus' ancestor. God and David had a very deep relationship. If you read all the texts about David, he made a lot of mistakes, but yet he came back 
continually to God, and he had a deep relationship with him. God had been with him through thick and thin. So God does the same exact thing you do when you are in a relationship. You make promises. These promises had an impact on David's present and David's future. God made promises. And for, for the present, based on the promises of God, David had the confidence that God would eternally be with him. God's presence would continue to give him joy throughout his life, just as a dear friend's presence gives us joy, something that we're not able to experience very much now, right? With social distancing, it's hard to, to have that, that close relationship that we used to have with our friends. Now it's over Zoom or a phone call. But it's the, it's the close presence of a friend that gives us joy. David knew that God, God's presence was going to provide stability in his life and guidance for his life. That's what we... We talked about last week, God is our guidance. However, David knew he would not eternally lay in the grave. David was also a prophet. He understood the promise given to him by God to mean he was going to be in God's presence forever. The resurrection, the second coming it was on the horizon. So David was correct in his understanding of this promise to him, but he didn't have a complete view of it. The prophecies God gave him were for him. They just weren't about him. They were about his descendant, Jesus. Having witnessed the events of the previous years and weeks Peter was able to kind of start filling in the details here. David spoke of someone whose body would lie in the grave but would not decay. David, he died, and his body decayed. So this prophecy cannot be about him. He believed that a descendant would sit on the throne after rising from the dead. It's Jesus who fulfilled this prophecy, which was promised by God. And the thing is, the events that, that Peter was speaking to these people about, they were not fictitious. Him and all the people that were there were witness to all these events that he was speaking of. Jesus did not stay in the grave. He was resurrected. God kept his promise because God is faithful. There we go. Let's continue reading our text. Acts chapter 2. Let's read verse 33 through 39. Acts chapter 2, 33 through 39. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and Having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into, he into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children and to all, all who are afar off. As many as the Lord our God will call. So just before Jesus died, 
he made a promise. The promise was that the Father would send the Holy Spirit to the disciples. He, he told them to wait in Jerusalem. And then also he repeated this after he was resurrected right before he went to heaven. He repeated this. He told the disciples, stay in Jerusalem. Wait for my spirit to come to you. And of course, they obeyed and the Holy Spirit came. And the manifestation of the Spirit, the speaking in tongues, that's what was causing all the disturbance in the temple that day. That's the context of this, these verses that we're reading. This is directly after the Holy Spirit comes to the, to the disciples and they're able to speak tongues. And so, God kept his promise. He promised that Eve would have a descendant that would save all of humanity. And he kept this promise. He promised to watch over David in life and death. And if you look at all the stories of David slaying Goliath, uh, killing the lion, there's so many stories that we see that this is true. God kept his promise. And he also promised to send his spirit to the apostles to help them before they went out into the world spreading the message of God. And as he promised, he did send them. And so we look at all the promises that God made throughout the Bible. All these promises that God has made throughout human history. And guess what? He has kept every single last one of them. So if he kept his promise in the past, we can have the faith and the confidence that he will keep his promises into the future. Now promises can be good, but promises can also be very bad. A parent can just as easily promise discipline as they can promise joy. And so, people on that day listening to Peter 2,000 years ago on those temple steps, they knew that God was a promise-keeping God. And they knew they were currently on the wrong end of God's promises. They couldn't change what God was going to do, but they could change how it would affect them. So, they asked, what do we need to do? And they ask Peter and the disciples, what, what do we need to do to be saved? And Peter gladly told them. He said, repent and show evidence of your repentance and God will forgive you. Oftentimes we're very skeptical when people make us promises. And we have good reason to be. Because when a promise comes from the mouth of a human there's no guarantee that they will keep that promise. But God is different. God always keeps his promises. God never allows the cost of keeping a promise to keep him from keeping his promise. And so, any other cost for God is so insignificant compared to losing his son, to giving his son for us. And there's no obstacle so insurmountable that our God, our loving and powerful God, can't get past. There's no obstacle that God cannot overcome. He overcame death in the grave, which is very good news for us, because God is faithful. There is one more promise that we are still waiting on that has not come to fruition. Let's, let's turn to Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them 
in white apparel. Who also said, men of Galilee, why are you standing here gazing up into the heavens? The same Jesus who you have seen taken up with, from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So before their very eyes, the disciples watched as Jesus ascended into heaven and a cloud uh, came in front of them and they can no longer see him. And they probably stood there puzzled, looking up into the air, questioning, well, what do we do now? Probably thinking, well, it's all over. There's, there's no future. Where do we go from here? Then two men, which we know are angels, came up and said, why are you looking up in the air? Why, why are you staring up there? They said, the same Jesus that you have seen go into heaven will be the same exact way that he will return. And I can imagine from this very point on, from that point on, that they would go outside and just sit there and look up into the sky, searching and longing and hoping to see Jesus descending in the clouds of glory. Church family, I have a question. Are we frequently looking up? Or are we going online to find the new COVID-19 update? Church family, are we eagerly waiting for Christ's soon return? Are we frequently looking up? Are we ready to meet our Savior and Lord in the air? Our Creator, our Redeemer? Are we ready to go home? Just before Jesus ascended into heaven, he told his disciples that no man knows the time or the hour of his second coming, of his soon return. Only the Father in heaven. And this is the final promise that we are still waiting on. We are waiting for Christ to come back and take us home. God was faithful on all the other accounts. So we can have the faith that God is faithful and that God will send his son back to take us home. But you may ask, how can I become ready? This is the same question that the people listening to Peter in the t on the temple steps that day asked. The same exact question. And what did Peter say? He said, repent and be baptized. We must allow God into our hearts. We must allow him to change us for the better. When an inward change happens, the outward sign must follow. So when our hearts are changed, what must follow? There must be an outward sign. Baptism. The inward, the outward sign must always follow the inward change. With the current climate of our world, if you have not made a decision to be baptized, don't put it off any longer. With, with this COVID-19, we thought it would be, be over with by now. But as I look out, everyone is wearing a mask, a face shield, whatever it may be. God is coming back soon. There's so much stuff happening in our world. Civil unrest, riots, don't, don't put it off. God is coming back very, very soon. Amen? Amen. So when I was a young man, I didn't think it was necessary to be baptized. To be honest, I really didn't want to get up in front of everyone. I'm an introvert. And so I said, I don't want to get up in front of all those people and be baptized. Look at me now. Uh, <laughs> but I, I thought in my head that I love Christ. I've accepted him into my heart, and that's good enough. 
But God worked on my heart, and he showed me through the counsel of a very wise youth pastor that I needed to be baptized. Like I said, the outward sign always follows an inward change, and there was an inward change in my life. So I made the decision to make the next step, to, to follow Jesus into the waters of baptism and, and symbolically follow him into the grave and be raised with him through baptism. God had made an inward change in my life. So I had no choice. I had to be baptized. And so if you are struggling with the decision to be baptized, whether you're sitting here today or watching our live stream or, or watching uh, the restream of it on YouTube, I encourage you to reach out to us. If you are struggling with the decision, if you want to be baptized, I encourage you to speak to one of us. Uh, for those of you that are watching online, send us a, f a Facebook message, call us, email us, whatever you have to do. Don't put it off any longer. Let us know if you want to commit or recommit your lives to Christ. And if you're struggling with this decision, I want to I pray for you wherever you're watching. If you're sitting here in these seats or if you're watching online, I would like to pray for you right now. Let's, let's bow our heads. Dear loving, gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking for wisdom and guidance for those who are struggling to make a decision for baptism. Give them peace in the assurance of your love. God, just show them that baptism is an important step in accepting you as their Lord and Savior. Show them just like you showed me. Help them with their decision. Give them the courage to take a step out into faith and follow you into the waters of baptism. All this we ask in your name. Amen.